everyone, we moved slightly south, Venice, and uh, I'm very happy to be followed by Anna Maria, so I don't have to bother you with a lot of historical <laughs> data, and it will be very well explained after. And speaking about history and the relationship with history and archaeology is something relevant here in Venice, because we can say that it's very, uh, in recent years, that history and archaeology have changed their idea about the origin of the urbanism in Venice, and everything's happened with the comparison of this size in the Adriatic Rim with the Northern Emporia. So the urbanism of the Northern Emporia has been much more than uh, central to reinterpret the site that were a lot of misconceptions uh, following classical past. And also the historian way, uh, the historical way to go through the written sources suffer the same problem. Uh, after having seen that in the first part of my presentation, I'll try to present you a different way to imagine Venice. Uh, between lagoon, water, and wood, so without the classical element of the city, stones, brick, and solid buildings. And I'll discuss briefly the idea of the island as urbanism, if it was a refuge or an opportunity. So, a lot of archaeology has been done in Venice or in the settlement around the Adriatic Rim, but the traditional oriented Byzantine uh, Venetian official historiography have completely shaped the, the interpretation, not only the historical one, but also the archaeological one. There was the idea of the classical city behind, so historians and uh, archaeologists couldn't believe that uh, the city that was the most important trade hub during the Middle Age wasn't similar to Rome or Constantinople, but was much more like to a week in the north of Europe made with wood and mud. So with that also we have to have all the preconception around terms like Carolingian, Byzantines, Barbarian, Slave and Islam in the moment when these research had been done. After the World War II, uh, the idea that the Lombards were German were significant and relevant. And so the idea to detach from whatever was the North, the North culture that completely um, cut the uh, long-lasting tradition of the classical Roman and Greek tradition was very strong in the local scholar. Um, moreover, Venice's past uh, has been shaped as history of a glorious freedom. So the early medieval settlement has been described as an example of equality and democracy. And in this framework, that is far to be uh, true, uh, of course, the referring to the classical values, moral values of classical Rome and the classical past were more than important. Um, moreover, uh, Venice has been interpreted up to very recent years only with uh, local written sources and the Carolingian and Arab sources have been completely left apart. So, imagining the early medieval Venice also, uh, we use for a long time the Venice that happened after, so the uh, Renaissance Venice, the Venice that we can uh, see in this picture. So we imagine the Venice of the past with the Venice that become after in the future. Uh, the northern perspective, as I said before, is uh, pivotal in, the, in reframing what was Venice, but not only Venice, a series of, a series of sites uh, that we can define a river line or delta site along the Adriatic Rim. All these uh, sites, uh, archaeologically speaking, are marked with a considerable Mediterranean trade, uh, and there is a very specific trade after the 9th century that we can uh, pick up in for Venice, or better say Rialto, that was the name in the 9th century of this, the city that we know today as Venice, uh, that entailed this trade between the Western Europe and the Islamic world. And among this trade, one of the key elements was, uh, uh, of course, the 
uh, slave trade, with this demand of slave from the Islamic world and the, uh, um, the role of the Venice, Venetians as middlemen in these transparent goods. So, uh, moving the idea of trade uh, with trading people uh, more than goods, oil and wine, is changing a lot also in the reinterpreting the, uh, the shape of the city. Uh, archaeology, contrary, uh, showed that um, there is a drastic reduction uh, on the number of the rural sites in Roman time on the area and the uh, landscape can tell us a lot in the changing of the hubs ports, markets, also quick and religion one, that they try to move where the waters were more deep. So there is a shift of uh, uh, emplacement of these sites uh, towards uh, the sea routes. So we have new settlement open and bigger than village, not yet uh, town that are polyfocal with many mm, points inside that are not necessarily connected together with uh, a richness in natural resources. The first Venice was not in Rialto but was in Malamocco, a site that is never been recognized by archaeology but is clearly in the point, uh, uh, I don't know, yeah, here. Uh, just behind the actual Venice. Uh, this movement towards uh, the seaside stops here for a while in the 8th century and the traces here are very ephemeral, only um, uh, water poles uh, uh, under the lagoon, uh, um, the lagoon level because the lagoon uh, changed the shape. So all these uh, uh, uncovered are underwater archaeologists. But nearby, still a part is possible to be, uh, to, to be studied with the archae traditional archaeological tool, and so we can have these very complex uh, sites, polyphocal sites, with monastery uh, fishing farms pro producing areas. Um, the environmental reconstruction of all these sites helps a lot to tell that all these sites were built around the rivers, so they were delta sites, river and sites, first of all, surrounded by a lagoon. So we can start to sketch in the medieval Venice. Here you have a torcello, this is a draw that I was doing, trying to explain to my students where we were excavating. But I think it tells quite a lot the density of the settlement, the density of the settlement that was completely built around water. There was no road. All the communication around the site were made by water. There was no path, no bridge. So for moving from one area to the other, uh, we were, uh, they were uh, forced to use a boat. All the elements, I don't know if you can see this blue dot, are water systems, so water reservoir. Venice is built on the water, but they need to spend a huge amount of money and workforce to build the fresh water reservoir because the water around is salty. This is an image of the excavation that shows you how dense and very structured was the settlement in the 10th century. So a lot of house around these public spaces uh, that is centered around the uh, water reservoir. This is the uh, aerial and um, photographic imaging of the 11th century Torcello. A wooden house, a wooden house, all the wooden houses were facing the channel. The main entrance was by the water. Um, the uh, backyard uh, was facing another backyard without uh, a path, as I said before. This is a section, a profile of one of these big systems that we do believe that is the first one up to now uh, found in Venice, and up to recently we thought they were only 13th, 14th century structures. The, the Venice is built on the water, but uh, was shaped. We can tell still in the uh, uh, urban structure of the today Venice that there was a lot of work on shaping straight channels. So all these islands that we are seeing are not the original Barena, as the Italian term of these shallow lands over the lagoon, but they were rectified and very proper, so very organized. So we can speak of a very peculiar urbanism where we have waterways, waterways without bridges, 
a lot of waterfronts with piers, dock and sloping shores. The public space are all occupied by water reservoirs, Pozzi, Pozzi la Veneziana. Uh, there are very few walking areas within the neighborhood, so the mobility is very restricted. And again, I have to stress for the Mediterranean scholars that it's an exclusive wooden civil structures. The stone and bricks were used only for the church, of course, or reused from Roman uh, nearby structures. If we have to conceptualize, maybe we have to completely take a, a different uh, uh, image. This is from Cambodia. And we had a floating city where the movement and the connection is the uh, water. If the water is the connection, the idea, the classical idea of water as refuge, so a place where the noble Romans would have rescued themselves for escaping the barbarians, is completely wrong. The idea to be in the water was linked with the idea to be in the most connected place in the 9th century. No Roman system is still in function after the 6th, 7th century in the whole North Italy. So be on the water meant be on the, uh, on the roads, on the connections. Um, but the urbanists also can give us hints on the social structure of this site. Here you have uh, a picture or reconstruction of the Comacchio, the site that maybe we have best excavated so far. Uh, so we have to start thinking about the social structure and how the First Venetian uh, they uh, conceptualize the spaces for ruling uh, an early important like that. Uh, again, an example of Comacchio that show you the huge amount of labor that uh, they need for building this kind of settlement. Um, thinking about hundreds of uh, uh, trees cut down and sold every day, if we think uh, in short time construction of the site that is very likely according to stratigraphy, it means that um, the local elites need uh, social strategies to control these workforces. Workforces that, uh, of course, uh, were employed also in building this water space. All these uh, 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 water line that we found that were not only meant for communication but also for fishing towns and for salt production sites uh, needed a huge amount of workforces. How many people live in this site? We started to do this uh, uh, modeling with uh, Torcello, for example, using, of course, all the ancient maps that we have. And, of course, we are reducing a lot the traditional number that local historians were giving to these places. So if we think that a place like Torcello, uh, during uh, uh, the 9th century, uh, could have a number of inhabitants that was more than 1,000, is already a massive number for a site like that. We have also to consider another kind of social presence in this site. We spoke about slavery and slave trade. So where these slaves were, uh, uh, were confined, and which are the structures that we are uh, we have to look for for having a material evidence of that. So to conclude, we have common space that all the times are orchards, woods, and water reservoirs, and these are hints of very high controlled social space. The moving through the site and the rowing through the site can be considered as a hint of a social or a gender inequality, because everyone was able to move from all the island, or having the island separated by water was possible to control the moving of people toward the island. And then, what about the coarse local workforce and the non-local traded slave? Is a hint of presence, and this difference can be seen in the uh, in, in the path of the city, in the building of the city. This is an answer that we are still looking for. I want to conclude you with these images and. Uh, this uh, urban that I show you is clearly fragile and is the same, pretty the same, of the uh, present day city. 27 million tourists last, day, last year, and with 50,000 inhabitants, I think we have to, to think about that. Thank you. <laughs>
Bot mano 